was always a dream to, well, make a video game. I guess everyone wants to do that. You really want to make fictional worlds. You really want to make your own universe. So we decided to leave everything. What started off as kind of a passion project turned into having a small staff and full funding. There's a lot of firsts here in this project. We knew it was like kind of way more than we could handle, but if we just work hard and put our minds to it and make the game we want to make, we think we can be super successful. Talamel is in its twilight. The sands have buried its kingdoms. Corruption unburies its subjects. From such bountiful seeds, this world has reaped only entropy, chaos, and night. And though the secrets of Talamel's ruination are entombed below the Sea of Sand, it's a truth that will not rest. I am Michael Schistik. I'm the art director for Sands of Aura. Sands of Aura is an action RPG in like a post-apocalypse fantasy setting. You're getting on your sand ship, you're cruising across this desolate wasteland of sand that was caused by this spell plague from ancient times, and the player is going to unravel and figure out why that happened and maybe what they can do about it. But it definitely emphasizes on action RPG being the difficult kind of brutal, learn to play it kind of way. You definitely will die a lot. I love a good boss encounter. I love overcoming a difficult situation. And it, for a lot of people it can be very frustrating, but the accomplished feeling that you get from overcoming these challenges, we think is the most rewarding thing you can have as a player. These bosses are like the climaxes of those areas, of those levels. So when you get there, we want them to be these cool, amazing, difficult, and, and almost cinematic encounters. Well done. The combat is not as instantaneous as a traditional action RPG. There's, there's a bit of weight to the character's swings and actions, so you do have to be deliberate in, in what you decide to do in combat. Learning how to do that dance with them. You got the dodge timing and you got the swing in, you got another, like the whip attack, you, you, you paired it at the right timing. Like It feels amazing when you're getting that dance down. The deaths will become less punishing and they'll come less often as you grow in experience as a player. And we really hope that the people have the willpower to get over that point. We talked about the grind and how difficult the game can be and how challenging these bosses are. And the boat is almost the opposite of that. It's the breath of fresh air of like, okay, 
I can kind of reassess myself. I can think about what I want to do. You can ride on those sand dunes and you can gain speed if you go down the waves and hop off them and you see the whole horizon in front of you of all these different features. And we wanted the, the design to be that whatever feature you see out in the distance, there's something there to go and explore. The simplest terms I could qualify how our art style looks is grim dark light. I think when you go completely grim dark, it's just kind of oppressive and overpowering. So we decided to have this mix. There's a lot of gray tones, there's a lot of like beiges and browns, but you'll get these interspersed scenes on the islands themselves that are brilliant with color and foliage and flowers. And all the different things that you can see in the game, like everything has a meaning, a reason, a story, a purpose. Every dead end has a, a reward. If it's loot or armor or reward, whatever it is, or an NPC or a character, like there should be always be something in every nook and cranny. And that's made the level design way more interesting and worth exploring. We want you to play with the different builds. I, I've always loved in, in MMOs and, and different action RPGs when you get to build the character you want to play. That actually mixes up the gameplay, that actually makes you think about what you're doing in combat. We want you to have that customization, so we needed to make sure that the armor and weapons and everything that you find to create and craft and customize your character is as unique and interesting as possible. The more inputs you have, the more infinite in range of combinations you can make. So there's things like uh, the rune system. The rune system lets you build specific stats into your gear that you want. Like let's say you want to be more armored, you get put in more armor runes, you want to be faster, you do haste runes. But on top of those, there's spell blade, which is an elemental enchantment that you can add. Then you have like fire, ice, and lightning that can vary the combat in different ways. And then on top of that, there's also armor sets that have very unique set effects that make the gameplay very different in how you approach combat. And then the weapons, there's weapon heads that have an effect, there's the weapon handles that affect the animation and have effects, and then finally there's pommels that all have like a poisoning effect, or like when you hit an enemy there's projectiles that spawn. Being able to build the character you want to play, that was what we wanted to do. Going forward, there's going to be these big patches, and there's going to be a lot that you can check out, and that's worth playing. I think we have an incredible team of artists and programmers. I'm proud of our team, I'm proud of our game, and I hope everybody enjoys it. like gravity. We are constantly falling forward without noticing it. But then it all stopped for me. Journal. It's been a while. I think. And I am still unsure why I am talking to you when I am clearly the only one listening. I guess to keep some sanity. Well, you are still stuck. If you are starting to lose it, please don't. That's the only way we can get back. I'm counting on you. Hello, I'm Mel Vigneault, the studio director of Elsewhere Experience, the studio behind Broken Pieces. I am also the sound designer and audio director for the game. Broken Pieces is a game that's set in a coastal village in France. It's an adventure game where you play a character named Elise. There's like some kind of paranormal phenomenon that are happening inside the village and she cannot escape.
Our goal for the game was to really catch the attention of the player and to do so we had to do something inside a, a world that's feeling very real, something that's tangible. You try and make the player believe in something and then you switch their perspective. If everything is very realistic, then when you have things that are paranormal, they meet in the cross point with the, the realism, the player would question at first and then integrate inside its perspective of the world. What we really wanted the player to feel is the anxiety and loneliness that the main character Elise is feeling. Loneliness, it's, it's a difficult uh, sensation to communicate. There's actually only one character inside the game. You don't talk with anybody, you don't interact with other people. You don't have music. When you want to play music, you actually have to use the tape player inside the game. And I think that's that's what life is about too. Sometimes you listen to music because you want to break this loneliness. Because there's so many moments where you don't have music, you have to have this constant soundscape of what's surrounding you. We did a lot of recording where we live and we really wanted it to be very present. All the environment were done by my associate Benoit. He drew most of his references from the region we live in and from the places we see every day. All the architecture uh, surrounding us that are not seen a lot inside the video game industry. We are a very huge fan of puzzle games, of course, and puzzles are very, very interesting because they, they, they give you the opportunity to insert story inside it, they give you the opportunity to, to to talk about things that interest you and they give you the opportunity to use the world fully and the exploration and, and the space you are in. The game is pretty unique, you know, the, the features there's inside it, the, the way we made things is very ours. We didn't compromise on that. Thanks a lot for checking out Broken Pieces with us and on espère que vous serez au rendez-vous. Merci. The world was once wrought with chaos, and life as we know it was threatened. But nature is resilient and refused to be broken. You are here to survive, and you are here to find this wisdom. There is a stillness waiting for you. Go and find it. Retreat to NN. My name is Justin Hosford. I'm the founder of Head West Studio, and we're making a game called Retreat to Enon. Retreat to Enon is first and foremost a survival game with a more relaxing angle to it and a little bit of mindfulness mixed in. I was trying to make a zen kind of experience, and I'd never seen that in a video game before as a core mechanic. Your abilities in the game are attached to your spirit level. If your spirit level drains, your health starts to drain and you lose the ability to do things like light a fire, craft items, sprint, hold your breath underwater for very long. So you need to keep your spirit level up in order to be more effective at survival. And the way that you keep your spirit level raised is through meditation. Meditation's had a profound effect in my life. It seems like something that maybe the world could use even more of now and if this little game can can help even one person achieve that i think that it's it's reached its goal gently close your eyes and take in a nice deep breath for years i was a film and television composer because of that, I was able to focus a lot of energy on the score to this game. And I didn't want to just do the obvious chill Zen music. You know, I wanted to make something emotional, even sad at times. I tried to make it, I guess, as connecting and beautiful as I possibly could. To connect people to nature, what we've done is made a very lush, full, rich environment. 
it's not procedurally generated. So every path you take, every valley you walk into, every corner you turn, I tried to make it have its own personality. On the main island of Enin, the tropical island, there's going to be creeks, ponds, uh, surrounded by a huge ocean. And when you go into the redwoods, that's uh, a much, much larger area. If the player is going to get lost, that's where that's going to happen. The majesty of seeing an elk or a wolf roaming around the Arctic level just looks really cool. All in all, I think that they're very immersive environments. I kind of want this to be a game where people get lost sometimes. Uh, there isn't a map or a compass. All you have is a home icon on the last place that you slept. The player's going to kind of have to watch where they're going and just keep an eye on where things are. You got to get out there. You have to explore. There's a variety of animals to hunt on all three biomes, like deer and elk. There are wolves in the game, and we have gillnet fishing. Basically, everything is gathered. You don't cut down trees in this game. You can collect the wood off the ground, the scrap wood and driftwood, and turn that into a beautiful wooden structure with the technology. There is no wasted item in, in the collection system. Every, everything has a purpose. It's a hope and a dream that maybe someday the technology that we're developing can actually help us live closer to nature and not continue removing us further from it. So it goes from kind of elementary, basic survival, all the way up to building this huge dream retreat. Even when the player gets done with the story of the game, they have the option, if they want to at any time, to return to this huge base that they've built and continue meditating and just have this place they can go to to relax anytime they want. Begin meditation. I want this to be a game where people just escape to their second home away from home and just be in this peaceful environment that they use their creativity to build and they're a part of the environment and not destroying it. My name is Reese. I'm the creator of Boundless Games. We're currently working on Monster Tribe, which is an open world RPG. It's a monster catcher game in kind of like a futuristic native tribe type of setting. What sets this game apart is we decided to go for more of a team-based battling combat. And so you actually use your entire team throughout all battles. And you have a lot of exploration elements that I find maybe aren't explored in most games. Through exploring the environment, you're going to come across a lot of secrets, whether that being treasure or resources or materials that you can use. There's four types of gathering you can do. There's harvesting, fishing, wood cutting, and mining. This system helps to give a sense of collection and accomplishment and almost adding a grinding element to our game. This is our, our downtime, our off time to offset the balance between battle after battle. What makes this game open world and you know non-linear is you can tackle any of the areas in the game at any point that you want to, and you can take them on in any order you'd like.
collecting monsters isn't the traditional throwing some kind of orb or object at it. And so in our game, instead, what we've done is we've created a system where monsters drop DNA as a battle reward. You can then take it to the DNA stations and you can use these to actually revive and resurrect these creatures to then, you know, have them on your team. Monster mutations is a mechanic in the game where you can mutate them using resources and items. And so originally it started off as just a way for us to get more variety in monster encounters that opened up to about 300 different combinations of creatures. And so we just kind of thought like, why not throw that into the player's hands that changes their element, their class, and also their design. Once we actually get into the battle encounters, it is a team-based battling system. So you'll have four slots for your monsters. And so you can have a four versus four uh, battle. And this takes place on a three by two style grid. You can have moves that hit all squares on the battlefield or just the front line or the two middle squares, dodging moves and kind of predicting uh, what your opponent has in their arsenal to strategize through more than just using the right moves on the right guys. You also have to worry about your position, the enemy's position in this group-based, turn-based combat. We've been working on this game for over two years now. I'm just proud of the entire process of making it and becoming a better developer because of this game. I'm Rico Lemba. I'm a game designer, programmer. We are a purely remote indie game studio based in Indonesia. We're about to release our first premium console and PC game, NHR. NHR is action RPG. It's a story-driven game about a pale wielder. So your goal is to find the lost villagers in the dungeon and return the village to its former glory. We want the combat to be behavior driven instead of stats driven. We try to explore more into a attack pattern side of the enemies. So maybe the enemies have the same HP, but because it has a different attack patterns and different variations to its attack, it makes things more interesting. And each boss in this game, there will be a little bit of puzzle solving. And sometimes you have to deflect their attacks to deal more damage. And I think that makes the boss more memorable. We combine the heavy attack and dodge button at the same button. It kind of forces you to be mindful because when you want to dodge, there is a bit of delay at the end of the dodge and that's kind of risky. And when you want to attack, it charges forward to enemies and that's, that adds a little bit of risk when you want to knock enemies away. Yeah, I think that creates a really unique combat system in general because it has so many uses. The core of this game is that you go to dungeon and then rescue some missing villager souls. They give you one of their abilities. For example, when we retrieve the chef, the kitchen will open, so you will be able to cook some foods. When you revive the lumberjack, it will open an upgrade shop. It's really satisfying. Because we, our expertise are pixel art, we decided to use a handcrafted visual uh, pixel art and then added a lot of HD on modern visual effects, just adding some overlays and then some volumetric lighting and everything. And just seeing the HD food painting is always satisfying. 
As for the character design, our art director suggested that we don't use his faces. I thought that was interesting. So we decided to use a lot of body language, kind of inspired by old cartoons. I think that makes the game really unique. We apply a lot of principles from the retro game. If you want to relate the game that you play on the childhood, I think you should definitely check Anuchart. It will rekindle that memories for you. Oh my word, is that a chicken? This is obnoxious! Why is a chicken out here working on the island? I mean, he looks so strange too. Look at his beard! Your task is to set up a thriving colony. Well, stop bothering me and start expanding my empire. Governor, you just keep on advancing, don't you? I'm almost starting to get impressed, really. I'm Tom. I'm the lead developer for Warmer Island at uh, my own company called uh, Berg Games. Warmer Island is a logistic focused game. Uh, so you have to manufacture goods, uh, ship them from place A to B. You start with one island. Uh, and of course, uh, the goal is to uh, get more islands over time. And pretty early on in the game, you get to meet the queen. And that's a real, well, a real character. Uh, a bit of a snarky uh, personality. It seems we're stuck between a rock and a hard place though. She becomes more demanding over time. You might have to start paying taxes, it gets more complicated. So you're gonna hire more workers, build production zones, uh, start shipping things to the other islands where you can grow new types of crops, research new opportunities. Uh, and of course you have to trade everything uh, around the world. Uh, you start with some uh, food and resources, but then you have to start setting up the production chain. Perhaps it's more interesting to take a more detailed look at bread. So to produce bread, you first have to grow some wheat, plant the, the crop of course, then you see it grow over time. It has to be watered every couple days. And once it's full grown, your uh, farmer will come in, use the site and harvest the wheat. So then you have to start building the mill with the walls, a small table for the flour, an input crate where the wheat is gonna go. And of course the mill itself where the wheat is grinded into flour. From there, you have to build a bakery uh, so yet another zone where you have to sign a baker with a bread oven, but it doesn't end there. Uh, because, well, with that bread I can hire workers, but I want workers on all my islands. So that one piece of bread produced on my first island has to go all over the world. The game is challenging you in, in various ways. You're gonna encounter the occasional disaster. Your island could be set on fire, maybe by the queen or maybe just by accident, who knows. A famine could happen, a plague. Different things can happen that disturb the way you were working before. At some point, you're gonna get at a tier that the queen really starts demanding taxes. Governor. And personally, I think that's where the game's getting a bit more difficult. Every month, she wants something different. And you know what she's gonna want next month, but not in what quantities. And then you have to provide it. And if you don't, there might be consequences. But I think the real challenge in the game uh, is, is definitely the core loop of getting the resources uh, across the different islands uh, to make sure that your workers don't starve, that they keep producing the things on the other islands as well. Uh, so you really uh, have to take care of the basics while expanding further. And I think that's a really cool, uh, challenging thing. At some point you wanna explore the rest of the world. So you build your first ship, load up some workers, some resources, and then you start sailing around to find the islands you need. Once you get close to an island, you'll discover it, see what kind of crops uh, grow there, what kind of mines you could build. There's all sorts of different islands, and that's a really cool thing. That also helps the replay value of the game. The world is dynamically generated with different islands, different positions, so every game is unique. 
Once you've settled a second island, you need to start setting up trade routes. You can configure what you want to load here, where you want to unload it, all these kinds of settings, so both islands get what they need. Former Island is a great addition to the genre, and the game just becomes more challenging over time. You start with a small colony, and then you're gonna conquer the world. It's, a, it's great fun, I can promise you that. Legends tell of a golden time in years past of great clashes, heroes, and triumphs that forged this world of splendor. But through the eyes of the orphans of war, all that can be seen now is a land picked clean by the cowards in the halls of power. Though forgotten by the people of this world, it seems the gods have seen fit to send us a weapon that would pierce the darkness. My name is Phil, and I am the co-founder of Dancing Dragon Games. Symphony of War, the Nephilim Saga, is the first in a strategy game series that we are developing. It is a political war drama. Your protagonist is an Imperial Army officer. Some shocking events happen, you get framed for murder, you have to clear your name. There's so many twists and turns, and you saving the world, as you do in these games. I love to tinker. I love to experiment. I want to be able to set this up and then auto battle. I want to have a little bit more automation. And Simply War delivers that exactly. It's turn based, and the bulk of your micromanagement is done before you go into a mission or a chapter in a home base sequence. And I love that. In the home base phase, you will be able to buy stuff, and that's, you know, higher conscripts or mercenaries. You can buy artifacts at the shop. Uh, you'll be able to tech up. You can go into the support conversations and you know have the characters interact with each other, react to the events of the world. You can do friendships, bonds, which is love and romance, and family. Tactical phase is the other half. Your squads that you've built are plopped down into a map. Boom, that's my army, that's my setup. It's beautiful. Mission go. So we've got open terrain, which includes your planes, your roads, grassland, stuff like that. And you've got your rough terrain, what's with your woods, your swamp, your townscapes. You have your squads and you've painstakingly made their formation, chosen their class, chosen their leader, their traits, their artifacts, and you send them in and you go and then you sit back and watch. The enemy is pretty clever in this game, I gotta say. Hats off to my programmer for that. So, I love the classes. There's heavy infantry, heavy cavalry, light cavalry, light infantry, archery, firearms, magicians, support, and dragons. You start at tier one, and then the ultimate is your tier four. You start as a, a piddly little guy with leather armor, and then you upgrade to a guy that's a little bit cooler, now he has full plate armor, and then you upgrade again to a guy that's really decked out in awesome, like, gilded armor. Out of 50 classes, I think we've done a really good job of getting a really big wealth of pixel art that we can use. And it's beautiful, very well animated. Yeah, class system looks freaking good. 
there's things that will shock you and they'll things that will surprise you and things that will delight you and things that will crush you it's just very visceral the world setting and the characters and the history it's it's all years and years in the making i want this game to really convey that it is an expression of myself. I know how magical that feels to kind of be whisked away into a fantasy world. Trust me, it's awesome. My name is Adriano D'Ambrosio. I am the main developer of Monster Outbreak. Monster Outbreak is a tower defense meets survival. So you're basically surviving waves of monsters, see how long you could last. I don't like to play games by myself. I like to share the experience with another person. For me, playing games is like building memories. Anyone could play, sit down with a friend that doesn't really know the game too much. Play the game and see how long you could get to and just have fun with your friend. My favorite part about the combat is like, I like the freedom to feel like I could do whatever I want. You can use every tool to fight and that every tool has their own special attack. So you could choose how you want to play and you don't feel restricted. We made the enemies very unique. Just we added salamanders that spit out bombs. We added monsters that jump over structures. We added monsters like the spike monster that closes and when it opens up, then you can do damage to it. All of our monsters have a different style totally. In between waves, you have a timer that you can gather resources. Different maps are rich in different things. You got to be careful with different types of resources that are available to you. The cooking is basically for you to regenerate your HP. The more complex recipe you make, the more HP it heals. But what's more valuable, in my opinion, is the potion making. Because you can make potions that make you stronger, faster, build faster. And so potions are very beneficial. With the resources, for the most part, you're building structures. You could build floor traps, like a portal, electrical trap, to crossbows, to cannons, the undead boss, which is really cool. And he really cleans up your base. Like if you don't kill him fast, like your base will be gone. We have three main bosses, and then we have a fourth boss. And this fourth boss is basically like the end game pain boss in monster outbreak you're gonna be surviving waves of monsters fighting a lot of bosses building your defenses it's just a game that anyone could pick up have a good time make good memories and bond over it
Happy birthday, Clef! I prepared an extraordinary present for you. A treasure hunt. Explore the island. Solve puzzles. Find all the hidden places. I hope you will enjoy this little quest, my bouncy bell. Hey, and I found a scarf. Is it yours? Hi, Emma. Uh, nope, it's not mine. Not really my style. You could put it in the lost and found box over there. I think I'll follow your advice. I hope my lucky scarf is still somewhere nearby. Oh God, I hope it's not lost. Hi there, Mark. Have you seen my scarf? I think I left it on my seat this morning. Uh, no, Sylvie. I don't think so. Have you checked the lost and found box? Ugh, oh, genius! You're right! For me, playing games is like building memories. We're pouring our passion into this game and it motivates me. Making the game, it just feels like this surreal experience. I come from a background that has nothing to do with video game development, and now it's my entire life and my new career. 